The ninth edition of the Neonatal Resuscitation Program was jointly released by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Heart Association on October 22, 2025. Alongside the 2025 CPR and Emergency Cardiovascular Care Guidelines for Neonatal Resuscitation, all instructor-led courses must implement the new standards by June 1, 2026, providing institutions several months to align simulation, policy, and clinical education. Renewal schedules remain unchanged, minimizing administrative disruption while standardizing education across neonatal and pediatric resuscitation programs. This synchronized release eliminates the lag that previously caused inconsistent guideline adoption across hospitals and training centers. These coordinated updates strengthen national consistency, ensuring that both obstetric and neonatal teams work from a unified evidence base. The improvement is significant as simultaneous rollout prevents the fragmented practice patterns that occurred after earlier editions when neonatal and pediatric revisions were released separately. The ninth edition introduces integrated scientific and educational updates that better connect evidence to practice. The revised algorithm reflects new priorities, such as incorporating cord management planning and flexible ventilation corrective steps. Deferred cord clamping now precedes initial assessment, and suctioning is reserved only for obstruction. These refinements simplify the sequence while preserving physiologic integrity during transition. All courseware now includes the textbook of neonatal resuscitation, 9th edition ebook, ensuring universal access to the same core reference. The 10 minute science in service course summarizes evidence supporting each change, while the redesigned pocket card replaces the older badge buddy format with a clearer, more legible reference. Together, these adjustments modernize how NRP content is delivered and reinforce consistent evidence interpretation among educators and learners. These revisions bring teaching and clinical material into alignment, which will reduce variability in interpretation. The digital accessibility and bundled resources will make maintaining standardized instruction easier, particularly for centers with limited library support or rotating staff. The first minute of the resuscitation algorithm has been refined to emphasize preparation and physiologic sequence. Birth now appears as a defined action, marking the start of structured assessment and intervention. Adding initiate cord management plan requires the team to confirm the cord strategy before delivery, ensuring readiness for delayed clamping or milking without disrupting immediate care. Routine suctioning has been removed from the initial steps and is only indicated when secretions clearly obstruct ventilation. Evidence shows that unnecessary suction can cause vagal bradycardia, apnea, mucosal injury, and desaturation, delaying effective ventilation. These complications are most pronounced in preterm infants with unstable tone or respiratory effort. Studies comparing routine versus selective suction found no improvement in oxygenation or heart rate but increased risk of hypoxemia and prolonged time to spontaneous breathing. Terminology now uses ventilation instead of positive pressure ventilation, aligning language with broader resuscitation science and simplifying team communication. This change corrects a long-standing habit pattern seen in many delivery settings where suctioning was reflexively performed. Eliminating that step decreases physiologic stress and promotes faster initiation of effective ventilation especially in infants with borderline respiratory effort. Cord management recommendations have shifted to emphasize placental transfusion and circulatory stability. Clamping should now be deferred for at least 60 seconds in all infants who do not require immediate resuscitation. Meta-analyses show that this interval increases as neonatal blood volume, improves iron stores, supports cardiovascular adaptation, and reduces the risk of intraventricular hemorrhage in preterm infants. The timing change also explains the removal of the one-minute oxygen saturation target, as delayed clamping typically postpones monitoring until after transfer to the warmer. Umbilical cord milking is permitted in specific cases. It may be used in non-vigorous term and late preterm infants between 35 and 42 weeks, but there is insufficient evidence for those between 28 and 34 weeks. It remains contraindicated below 28 weeks because of the increased risk of severe intraventricular hemorrhage demonstrated in randomized trials. The update is practical and evidence-based. 
Extending the delay makes physiologic sense, but implementation depends on interdisciplinary coordination. Delivery teams must anticipate whether resuscitation can safely occur with an intact cord, particularly in very preterm or growth-restricted infants. Oxygen management recommendations are updated to reflect normal postnatal transition. The target saturation table now begins at 2 minutes instead of 1, acknowledging that pulse oximetry cannot be placed until after cord clamping and that healthy infants typically reach 60% saturation beyond the first minute. Large observational studies confirm this delay represents normal physiology. Initial oxygen concentrations are now gestation-specific. Term and late preterm infants begin at 21%, those 32 to 34% weeks at 21 to 30%, and those under 32 weeks at 30% or higher. Research comparing high and low oxygen strategies shows no mortality benefit to higher oxygen levels, but an increase in oxidative injury markers. These data support using the lowest concentration that achieves expected saturation trajectories. This change better reflects physiologic transition and reduces the risk of hyperoxia, retinopathy, and oxidative stress injury. For experienced clinicians, the new approach aligns with current bedside titration practices, but it will require continued emphasis on prompt oximetry placement and vigilance in adjusting delivered oxygen concentration dynamically. Ventilation parameters are clarified for greater physiologic control. The recommended rate range expands to 30 to 60 breaths per minute, recognizing that effective ventilation varies with lung compliance, size, and clinical response. The starting peak inspiratory pressure is standardized at 25 centimeters of water with acceptable ranges of 20 to 25 for infants under 32 weeks and 25 to 30 for those 32 weeks and older. These parameters balance alveolar inflation with reduced barotrauma risk. The evaluation window before corrective steps extends to 15 to 30 seconds, allowing sufficient time for the heart rate to respond to adequate ventilation. Heart rate rise and visible chest movement remain the gold standards for effectiveness. Evidence supports this timing as it reduces unnecessary escalation when adequate inflation is already achieved. These refinements simplify early ventilation and promote a measured approach. Expanding the acceptable rate range gives skilled clinicians flexibility to tailor ventilation while keeping focus on physiologic response rather than arbitrary numbers. This is a practical improvement that reflects real clinical conditions during resuscitation. Ventilation strategy updates emphasize efficiency and clinical judgment over rigid sequencing. The MRSOPA corrective steps may now be performed in any order based on the most likely cause of inadequate ventilation. This change is supported by studies showing faster restoration of effective ventilation and heart rate rise when clinicians correct obvious issues first rather than following a strict procedural list. The focus shifts from memorization to rapid problem identification using visible chest movement, airway pressure response, and physiologic cues. The laryngeal mask airway is now recognized as an acceptable primary interface, no longer limited to rescue use. Evidence demonstrates similar or higher success rates compared with face mask ventilation particularly when airway seal or facial anatomy complicates mask use. The device's ease of insertion and minimal training requirement make it effective for both term and preterm infants when intubation is delayed or unfeasible. These updates make NRP more reflective of how real resuscitations unfold, unpredictable and time sensitive. Experienced providers can now prioritize interventions based on observation and experience rather than a rigid step order improving time to effective ventilation, and reducing escalation to invasive procedures. Airway guidance is expanded to improve accuracy and reduce adverse events. A new size category for infants under 800 grams recommends a 2.5 millimeter endotracheal tube with a 2.0 option for extremely small infants. Weight thresholds for larger tubes were increased to better reflect airway size data from neonatal autopsy and imaging studies. While these refinements promote precision, they rely on estimated gestational age since exact weight is unavailable during delivery. Depth placement now references the upper maxillary gum instead of the lip. This anatomical shift provides a stable landmark, avoiding variability from lip pressure or retraction.
Even half a centimeter can change position from tracheal to main stem or lead to accidental extubation, especially in infants under one kilogram. Early trials using gum-based measurement showed higher radiographic accuracy and reduced need for repositioning. This is a meaningful improvement in standardization and patient safety. However, it will require intentional retraining to ensure consistent measurement technique, and clinicians must remain aware that gestational estimates, not weight, will still drive initial tube selection in emergencies. The ninth edition introduces three specialized courses expanding neonatal resuscitation beyond the delivery room. NRP Cardiac Addresses Delivery Management of Infants with Congenital Heart Disease, Resuscitation in the NICU focuses on postnatal emergencies such as respiratory failure, circulatory collapse, and arrest. And neonatal education for pre-hospital professionals provides training for EMS teams managing newborns before hospital arrival. The resuscitation in the NICU course fills a critical gap. Historically, NRP stopped at delivery. While events in the NICU relied on PLs, which does not address preterm physiology or neonatal arrest mechanisms. Most NICU codes involve progressive decompensation rather than sudden cardiac arrest, requiring tailored algorithms for ventilation, perfusion, and thermoregulation. The new course establishes evidence based guidance for these scenarios, aligning response with neonatal pathophysiology and improving continuity from birth to later deterioration. This addition is overdue and clinically relevant. It resolves the long-standing ambiguity about which guideline applies to late transition infants and ensures that teams have structured education for the complex physiology seen in postnatal NICU resuscitations. Implementation follows a structured national timeline. The ninth edition becomes available for use on October 22, 2025, and all instructor-led courses must fully adopt it by June 1, 2026. Institutions are expected to use this period to revise curricula, retrain staff, and align policy with the updated algorithm. Provider renewal intervals remain unchanged, reducing administrative disruption while enforcing consistency by the transition date. All instructors are encouraged to complete the complementary Science in-Service course, which summarizes the underlying evidence for each change. This uniform rollout model ensures that all facilities adopt the same standards simultaneously, preventing the staggered and inconsistent implementation seen after previous editions. The timeline is realistic and practical, allowing for retraining without interrupting certification cycles. Institutions that use this transition period strategically can integrate simulation, update documentation, and establish clear evaluation metrics before the enforcement deadline. Key takeaways. Focus on evidence-based refinement, streamlined process, greater flexibility, and expanded scope. Core updates integrate current physiologic data, replacing rigid procedures with responsive, observation-based decision-making. Simplification reduces redundancy, while flexibility empowers experienced providers to tailor interventions according to heart rate response and chest movement. The new courses extend neonatal resuscitation education across the full continuum of care, including NICU and pre-hospital environments. This removes the ambiguity that historically surrounded postnatal deterioration, providing a defined framework for resuscitation beyond the delivery room. Clinical judgment remains central, reaffirming that NRP is a guideline, not a mandate. These changes represent meaningful evolution rather than wholesale redesign. They improve physiologic accuracy and usability, but rely on institutional readiness and staff education for consistent results. The real measure of success will be how effectively teams integrate these principles under pressure, not merely their familiarity with the algorithm. Resources for adoption include the October 29th launch webinar, reviewing science and implementation details, and the 10-minute science in-service course summarizing all evidence-based changes. Updated pocket cards and teaching materials are available through the American Academy of Pediatrics to ensure use of verified resources. Institutions should use the official NRP website as their primary reference for all transition materials, instructor toolkits, and clarification updates. This presentation provides interpretation and context only, not formal instruction. 
Verification of policy and practice must occur directly through the official NRP resources to ensure compliance with 9th edition standards. The streamlined access to digital resources reflects modern educational priorities. Teams now have immediate online access to official updates, minimizing the lag between evidence release and clinical application.